uh, friends from academics, media, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the first NICE webinar on emerging trends in Nepal India relations. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy and a world free from conflict. We envision a world where source of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved and peace is advocated. NICE has four major research centers, China studies, neighborhood studies, non-traditional security studies, and defense and security studies. Similarly, we have eight major research topics, border and transboundary water politics, China's Belt and Road Initiative, climate change and energy, disaster management, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, Indo-Pacific affairs, international economy and development, refugee and migration. We do not need any explanation that today's seminar is very timely and significant. To discuss on this important topic, we have excellent panel. We'd like to welcome Professor S.D. Muni, who need no introduction. Professor Muni has been exceptionally kind to me. Thank you, sir, for your kind presence. We have former ambassador to Nepal, Ambassador Ranjit Rai. Ambassador Ranjit Rai was an ambassador to Nepal in most crucial time. Sir, we are glad for accepting our invitation. Similarly, we have Dr. Constantino Xavier, a very good friend from JNU days, who is a fellow at Brookings, India. From the Nepali side, we have Mr. Akhile Supadhyay, senior journalist and currently senior fellow at IIDS. Nice, would like to congratulate Mr. Padia for his new role. And the last speaker we have, Ms. Apeksha Saha, my colleague and assistant professor from Department of International Relations and Diplomacy, Sivan University. And to initiate this wonderful session, we have a very old friend and a visiting fellow of NICE, Mr. Atul Kumar Thakur. Mr. Atul Kumar Thakur is a visiting fellow at NICE. His research focus are quite diverse and reach to areas of public policy and affairs, microeconomic policies, and international affairs with a special focus on South Asia. Mr. Thakur is a New Delhi based public policy professional. He's a Deputy Secretary, State Development Council, and Nodal Coordinator, India Nepal Center, PhD CCI, and a columnist at different newspapers of India and Nepal. His books are, are included, like in India Now and in Transition, and India Since 1947, Looking Back at a Modern Nation. Before I hand over a floor to a moderator, I'd like to make a very brief comment or rather queries that I would like to raise so that it will set the tone of the talk. First, Nepal and India mentions about special relations. If it is so, then why there is so many, why there is so much constraint in the relations every few years? In Nepal, is Nepal really a special for India? That is my first question. Second, border issue is quite sensitive. It's equally sensitive for both big and small, powerful and weak, developed and disdeveloped countries. How should both the countries handle this? I wish Indian participants to come with suggestions for Indian government and Nepali participants to come for the Nepalese government, not vice versa. Why both the countries have wasted six decades without resolving border between them? Since both have coded relations, it must be easy compared to Pakistan and China. I personally feel that we all present here are equally responsible. We raise it and forget it. Our government, our media, academicians, policymakers, and even common people. I would like to ask the Indian panel, can there be any mechanism like the eminent person group or any mechanism at government level to resolve it? Would you like to take an initiative to push for this as you have been working for the betterment of relation of the two countries? At our level, what can we do? What can Nepal do? Simply, what can NIC do? How can we facilitate a dialogue between the two countries? Please suggest us because we'll be glad to take it forward. Can we have a monthly dialogue like this at people to people level? I think if you want a special relations to continue, we have to act now. Professor Muni and Mr. Rai may suggest on this. Maybe we can put the experts from both the countries like this kind of webinar, share our maps, stands, clear our confusions and resolve it amicably. Finally, why do China have to always come when you talk about relations between two countries? Why do India believe that Nepal is not capable to think for its national interest? Why do Nepal have to make choices between China and India? Most so when India is developing deeper relations with China. The type of engagement between the two countries is remarkable. Just count the number of meetings between Modi and Xi Jinping. Even Nepalese Prime Minister has not made so many meetings with Indian Prime Minister Modi. Ladies and gentlemen, we, have, we hope we'll be enriched with today's discussion. We will return home informed and with commitment to build better relations. We have got around 50, 50 raised registration excluding our faculties. Most of them are from border towns of both the countries. 
and this shows the sensitivity uh, of the matter. It will be broadcasted on Facebook Live so that we can accommodate all our guests. Please follow us on Twitter at contact NIIC or follow us on Facebook. You can put your questions there and it will be answered. Those who are in the room, uh, Zoom room can send the question through chat box. We'll not take direct questions to avoid disturbance. I once again welcome everyone to our program, all the panelists and participants. Thank you very much. Atulji, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bamu. Uh, since we are running behind the time, I will not take much of the time. You have already set the tone. Uh, I take the privilege to uh, invite uh, Professor S.T. Muni. Uh, you are right, please. You are right, please, so that he gives more inputs. He is apparatus, uh, apparatus professor at JNU and a living design when it comes to the other part of the Sir, it's over to you. Well, I, I don't. Well, um, I wish you had started with Ambassador Rai. Uh, they, he knows uh, more about the political and diplomatic aspects. But I briefly initiate no, just sir, one, one this, statement very briefly. That look, uh, uh, we two countries are uh, not only geography. Geography has decided for us to be together. History, culture, civilization, all have decided us to be together. But gradually, we are both changing. And in, in this process, either side is not keeping uh, pace with the changes which are taking place. I quite understand that uh, India has not been able to understand how Nepal has been changing, how the aspirations of young people are there, how they want to fulfill them, how they have a greater sense of, much greater sense of identity and nationalism than what they had earlier, uh, maybe during the Rana period, maybe during the Shah period, uh, even otherwise. There was a time when uh, India and Nepal literally merged together into each other. Uh, and, and from that, we have come a long way. Therefore, the old methods, I'm sure uh, Nepalese do not know India. Tell me how many India Studies Center you have in Nepal? Not even one? No. Despite that, everybody is an expert on India. You know, that's what uh, the kind of nature is. Therefore, India is changing. India is becoming more nationalist. India is very economically developed now. It has its own ambitions and aspirations to be an Asian, major Asian player, if not the global power. And this has implications for bilateral relations. And we must try and understand each other before I come to any specific issue. Now, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, 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 Dr. Jaiswal brought in the China factor, why it should come. China has always remained engaged with, uh, earlier through Tibet, Whenever it was powerful, it asserted itself in Tibet, asked some of these countries, they even, there, there were historical times when Kashmir was asked to pay tribute to the Chinese. And, and uh, you know, there, there, there are historical periods, but in the last 10 years, the style of the Chinese engagement with South Asia has radically transformed. Earlier, uh, after India's independence, China came to South Asia on the invitation of the South Asian countries, mostly. Nepal wanted, whenever they wanted to counterbalance their discomfort vis-a-vis -vis India, China was willing to come in. For the past 10 years, China wants to be present in South Asia, and China has its own interests. It has its strategic interest economically. Look, we in South Asia are a market of 1.6 billion people. They cannot ignore us. And therefore, they want to be all around with us. They have deep security concerns in Indian Ocean, everywhere else. They have deep security concerns regarding Tibet and Xinjiang. Therefore, they want to be in South Asia, present on their own. And they are far more assertive than what they were. This is what I would say. Therefore, it is impossible to think of the South Asian relations and the changes which are taking place in India's neighbors in their approach towards India without factoring in if there is any Chinese influence. So this is very natural. And of course, the India-China competition has also become far more intense. Therefore, there was a time uh, uh, to, to promote, I may remind, and my Nepali friends, I may remind, in the 50s, 
China used to give intelligence to India on countries of around it, including Nepal. You know, when the Nepal king Mahindra was hobnobbing with the US, it was the Chinese who first informed Nehru. Nehru did not know this. So there was a time when China had accepted India's primacy or India's strategic interests in this region. Now there is a time China is not willing to accept. Therefore, it is challenging. And from Indian point of view, it would always become a factor for us to think. That's why India is brought in, uh, sorry, the China is brought in. And I'm sure China is brought in in awareness of this fact that China is more powerful, more assertive, more resourceful, and wants India's influence to be reduced. All other neighbors are also using China in one way or the other. So this is a fact of life. I think we must recognize. I will stop here so that others can come in. Uh, sir, if I can intervene here, it's your permission. China has refuted that China has no role to play between India and Nepal manipulations. How do you see this I, 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 your Atul, your audio is uh, not very clear to me. Sir, please sir, repeat your I question. No, I can't. I'm not getting it yet. Pramod, there, will you do something with the audio? I'm not. I'm sorry. Can I audible now? You are audible, but not clear. You know, your voice is dropping in between, and uh, some wobbling is happening in the voice. Sir, my, sir, my there is another China. message I can't hear Atul well. I can't hear Atul well. From Jaya Nepali to everyone. Yeah. So maybe I will come back again. Uh, in the meantime, can I request uh, Ambassador Ranjit to please start his address? Yeah, thank you, uh, Atul. And, Ambassador uh, Ranjit, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And thank you to NIICE and Dr. Jaiswal. Uh, for organizing this uh, event. Uh, and, you know, I think between neighbors, it's very important uh, that we have uh, constant and frequent exchanges on, you know, the diverse aspects of our relationship. I entirely agree with what uh, Professor Muni has said, that, you know, you have a new generation in Nepal, a new generation in India, new circumstances. Circumstances today are not what they were five or six decades ago. Uh, so, and it's of course also a new world. Uh, you can see what is happening globally in terms of, you know, between US and China, uh, you know, what's happening within the European Union. So clearly all these factors impact uh, on our relationship. And, uh, you know, any relationship, uh, however, howsoever close, has to be nurtured constantly. You know, if a sense of complacency sets in, then I think things start to go wrong. Even in the best of relationships, you have to continue working uh, uh, at the relationship and improving the relationship. That's point number one. The, you know, second point is, I think Dr. Jaiswal has laid the floor for a, a sort of, a, you know, longer term relationship and what are the elements driving it? What are the emerging trends? But, you know, it, uh, 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 given the fact that we are talking today when, you know, the whole world is grappling with COVID, uh, 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 the, the humanitarian and the economic impact, I think this is one area where our two countries really need to cooperate uh, uh, in many ways, you know, in terms of the Nepalese labor here, Indian labor uh, uh, in Nepal, uh, 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 labor in the Gulf countries, uh, you know, there are a whole lot of issues and the whole economic impact of that. I think that is a conversation that is very, very critical. And given the fact that we are two friendly countries, I think that is a conversation that uh, must take place between the concerned authorities. Now, longer term vision and, you know, emerging trends. See, the world, as I said, has changed. We have changed. So we should really think of, you know, what is the kind of India-Nepal relationship that we want looking into the future. We are in 2020. So at 2030, what kind of relationship do we want? You know, the reference was made to a special relationship. Now, what does this special relationship mean? What does it mean at the economic level? 
What does it mean in terms of the political and security relationship at the level of the people to people uh, uh, conversation? Professor Muni, in fact, said that, you know, people in India are not aware of what's happening in Nepal. In Nepal are not aware. And in fact, you know, a lot of the time, the only news that gets media attention is the bad news, uh, you know, within, uh, especially both conventional and, and social media. So, you know, we really need to have this con kind of conversation. I know Nepal, you know, wants to become a developing country, it wants to graduate from the LDC to the DC status. So in the plan that Nepal has to achieve this, where does India sit? What is the contribution that India-Nepal relations uh, can make, uh, you know, towards achieving this uh, objective uh, 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 of in, 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 in Nepal? Uh, uh, for instance, you know, from our perspective, mm -hmm. we look at this mm -hmm. whole sub-region and region as one integrated uh, economic space. And, you know, uh, uh, we feel that the stronger the cooperation between our countries, uh, the, the, the more the benefit to each country individually, to the region collectively, and to the bilateral relationship. So I think, you know, all the connectivity initiatives, the joint projects, sub-regional cooperation, hydropower cooperation. So these are some of the critical elements uh, in this process. But obviously, to achieve this economic vision that we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, there needs to be much more political trust, uh, far greater uh, mutual understanding, and this we have seen in recent months and days and, and, and years has sometimes been in short supply. And you know, from the Indian perspective, we see that India tends to become a very big factor in the domestic politics of, of Nepal. And you know, this kind of nationalism that has been built up uh, in Nepal is vis-a-vis -vis India. And I think in Nepal, people tend to underestimate the impact this has in terms of the India-Nepal relationship and cooperation. So I think this is one factor which has also to kept in mind. Uh, Professor Muni has already referred to the China factor. And obviously, you know, everybody in India knows that China is a neighbor uh, of Nepal. And obviously, Nepal would like to have good relations with China. India also is developing its cooperation rapidly with China, though we, of course, have a lot of problems uh, on the border and, you know, some of that you are seeing uh, uh, in, in current days. But, uh, you know, sometimes the impression we get, and for instance, in the last few weeks, of the kind of role that is played by China, uh, not just in terms of economic projects, which obviously will benefit Nepal, but also in terms of domestic political processes in Nepal. And, you know, this obviously uh, uh, raises some issues uh, in India. And I think this is also a factor then naturally that uh, uh, impacts uh, on the relationship. Uh, on the boundary issue, this is my last point, you know, on the boundary issue, you know, these are historical issues. These have been left to us by the British. India was a colony under the British. Nepal had a very special treaty relationship uh, with the British and basically the British called the shots. Uh, now to reopen some of these issues, uh, you know, so many decades after the British have left is a bit like opening a can of worms also. You know, I've been reading a lot of the Nepalese press and, you know, all the maps and information, etc. And we have similar evidence and information on our side. And, you know, obviously both governments are prepared to look at this and try and find an amicable solution. But the only point I want to make is, you know, for instance, the, the change of the, the map of Nepal uh, and the constitutional amendment will make this problem more difficult to resolve in the future. I don't know when the map of Nepal was last changed, perhaps after the 1860 agreement uh, between uh, uh, British India and Nepal. Uh, so, you know, so a change in the map uh, means that you are tying future governments. Uh, and, you know, while it might be easy to get a constitutional amendment, uh, uh, you know, when you add territory to your country, 
but uh, getting a constitutional amendment when you have to leave some territory uh, uh, in the context of uh, a bilateral settlement uh, is probably going to be extremely difficult, you know, given the kind of uh, politics that we see. Uh, so I, I really feel, uh, you know, and the last point is also that, you know, you need to have a calm situation and appropriate atmosphere, you know, whipping up sentiments and, and, and you know, a lot of uh, fury and fire uh, 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 in the air is really not conducive. And, you know, sometimes we feel that these issues are actually, while, you know, they are uh, important issues, they're also used uh, to serve uh, uh, domestic political purposes uh, without regard to the impact that they may, may have on bilateral relations, uh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, with India. So, you know, these are just some of the points that uh, come to mind. And, you know, I'd be very happy to, to participate in the discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, just one observation I have here. Uh, if, if I'm audible, sir. Yes, you are audible yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. sir. Uh, you have said that uh, there has been no written about, about, about the boundaries, which is well taken. Uh, how, going forward, how, what solution you would like to offer for uh, moderating the relationship between India and Nepal? Because the kind of debates are being pursued now is, is, is simply worrisome. We have to be mindful about that. You have seen the situation in both in Indian press as well as in Nepalese media. So, do you have something for moderation? No, I think this is a very good point. And, you know, I think uh, the conversation between the two governments uh, should begin uh, in right earnest uh, on this uh, matter. Yeah. At and you're talking about secretary level at foreign secretary level yeah we have an established mechanism and you know that mechanism can decide uh, you know some of these talks could be very very detailed so there is also a joint technical committee so right. it, you know talks can be held uh, you know this is the, for the foreign secretary mechanism to decide who, how they want to carry forward the process but the point you made is very right that today you know we are living in this world of social media and instant communication and so uh, it actually affects the people-to-people -people understanding of each other and each other's country. And, uh, you know, it, it may create uh, some confusion in the minds, you know, of people on both sides of the border. And I think this is something we have to be very cautious about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have heard the uh, Indian perspectives. Now I will invite uh, Mr. Atlee Supadre, our editor-in-chief of uh, Kathmandu Post and senior fellow at uh, IIDS Kathmandu. IIDS is, uh, is the oldest think uh, tank in Nepal. Uh, over to you, sir. Mr. Obade. Hello. <coughs> yes. And can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jaiswal and Atul, for organizing this. And uh, strange that it may sound, you know, the COVID pandemic and the lockdown has actually given us opportunity to talk. Uh, you know, on, a, on an issue, you know, uh, that is very, very important to all of us. In an unusual manner. A very unusual, but, uh, you know, these are times when we are looking for silver lining on very difficult times. So, in a way, I would say thanks. And I have, uh, to be honest, attended more webinars in, on international relationship this last uh, 40 or 50 days than for in, in years. So, yeah. Good. Okay, uh, that said, let me get start to the business at hand. And uh, I would also, you know, I was telling Atul that, you know, because the, some of the topics are very sensitive, uh, I would like to read out some of the areas where I've quoted certain books or text with your due permission. Yes, sir, please. Uh, uh, yes, Ambassador Rai and Professor uh, Muni and Constantino, again, very, very nice talking to you and having a face time with you. Uh, first of all, let's all agree that we need to bring the temperature down, you know. Dr. Rai was just, uh, sorry, Ambassador Rai was just saying, you know, when I look at the social media on both sides, and also perhaps a bit of media, uh, you can see, you can gaze the temperature is very, very high. So we, we need to bring the temperature down. And how do we need, how, how do you do that? Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And how do you do that? Possibly because the scale is already very high. It probably means starting out with communications at the highest political level, just to assure the population on both sides that it is being taken care of. Maybe 
Prime Minister Oli and Prime Minister Modi can have a dialogue and the people would then, uh, the, the diplomats and the bureaucracies can subsequently take up the issues. Now let's move to the broader issues at hand. You know, and then I kind of would like to start from some of the analysis I've heard from Indian uh, writers and authors and foreign policy analysts, uh, both on television, but also read, on, read uh, some number of articles. Now, Indian uh, there's argument that the Oli government has deliberately stoked this for its survival, playing a nationalist card. Uh, for his part, the Indian Army chief has implied that China has stoked the incident. Now, it's very hard, you know, at this point in history to pinpoint, at least now, what, what were the exact turn of events. But what is certain as of now is that such claims definitely haven't uh, helped, you know. It, they have only raised the temperature, both in India and Nepal. So let's not forget, Nepal also enters a new election cycle in two years, and a festering border dispute would not be in anyone's interest now that the Jenny is out of the box. And these will have consequences for both India and Nepal, no matter whoever leads the government in Nepal. So, uh, you know, and if I may, you know, as much as it is a boundary map issue, boundary dispute, the Kalapani will have to be resolved if I, I want to argue at a political label, it is a politi it needs a poli political solution. Now, uh, let me offer some flash points as I see it in Kathmandu, from Kathmandu. The fact that it was done by defense minister, I mean like the opening of the road, the track, it has obvious defense implications as we see it from Nepal. Indian army chief, again, from Nepali point of view, made a very provocative provocative statement that Nepal was acting on someone's behest, indicating again, obviously at China. Now, Nepal has subsequently published a new map claiming its sovereignty over the region. The move, please note, the move has been welcomed in Nepal by political parties and the public largely. May please give the main opposition Nepali Congress and other political parties equal credit for this. You know, it's just not a ruling party issue and they, they need not alone take credit for this. Here is an important point to note, as I would say, Oli's government urgency in handling the issue did not precede the national outcry, rather it followed it. So again, messy that they often are, democracies need to respond to public you know, demands. No one knows it better than my Indian colleagues here. Now, some historical facts on the dispute. Nepal has been seeking talks with India ever since the new map came out in November last year, 2019. And for, I know, since New Delhi published new map on the chain status of Jammu and Kashmir, which puts Kalapani within its territory. And why the uh, talks haven't happened, uh, that would perhaps best be answered by some of my colleagues that side of the border and Delhi would best know the issue. And another important issue that really rankles in the place is the EPG report completed with a lot of hard work for months, again, has not been received by Indian government. So these are important things to bear in mind as we talk about Kalapani. A bit more of history here to argue Nepal's claim over Kalapani is longstanding, that's my argument. Though it became vocal only after 1990, my colleague Apeksha Sa, who's here, will probably elaborate on the, you know, kind of how the, the documentary evidence of why it is a border, uh, how Kali is the border, uh, delineates the border between the two um, countries, you know, uh, and the Sugoli Treaty of 1916. Uh, she's done far more studies than I have on that topic, and I defer it to her. Now, when Prime Minister Mon Manmohan Adhikari, then CPNUM with CPNUML visited in Delhi in 95. He raised two major points. One, revision of Treaty of Peace and Friendship, but also the disputed border territory. And many subsequent joint communiques, many subsequent joint communiques duly mentioned the outstanding border issue. 
Nepalese who were in government in 1962 during the India-China border war offer two explanations on how the Indian troops came to occupy Kalapani. You know, there are various explanations and I don't want to go into details. One I found particularly interesting was Nehru and uh, King Mahendra had a dialogue and because they saw Kalapani as a very uh, strategic point from where the Chinese army could possibly march into the Indian plains and make further inroads. Uh, they wanted Kalapani, uh, as I say, watch, you know, outpost to watch the Chinese movement. And, the, and then the, the agreement between the two, King Mahendra and Prime Minister Nehru was that then they would subsequently back it right after the war. And the other explanation is uh, the Indian, uh, you know, in the, in the Indian, army post came to be established in the region without in Nepal's knowledge. And when King Mahendra was notified, he said it would not be very wise to intervene and ask them to vacate the post in the middle of a war. We would then be seen as taking sides with China against India, which he argued would uh, then be seen as compromising on Nepal's neutrality uh, you know, in, in the war. Now the question may arise, why did Nepal not raise the issue after 1962? Again, you know, I've interviewed many people, read some literature on this. And the most plausible explanation for me is this. King Mahendra was so consumed internally to prop up Panchayat regime in the 60s. He thought he would rather keep India on his side for his legitimacy, his regime's legitimacy, rather than confront it. You know, uh, you, you may call it some kind of political quid pro quo, if I may. Uh, now, despite the institutional shortcomings, you know, um, why did Nepal then not pick it up after 1990? This is another issue that I have seen in an analyst phrase in their recent queries, again on television and you know, and, and, and print media. Now, again, for me, it's very simple. Uh, Nepal's political parties will have to primarily uh, take the blame for the failing, you know. Their diplomacy have lagged foresight and inconsistency, not to talk of frequent changes in government last since 1990 after the restoration of democracy. So despite these institutional shortcomings in government, governments, why did Nepal start becoming vocal on the border issue after 90? You know, the answer is very simple to me at least. We were now a democracy. I want to make a very important point here. Nepal wants its neighbors, not least a democratic India, to recognize the fact that it was only after 1990 that Nepal's national capacity and newfound democratic space allowed Nepalese to conduct independent research on controversial border issues. Until then, it was very much the regime's issue, you know. We're not allowed to speak. I have my own personal experience in the early days of my, uh, 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 of my journalism. Now, as a result, both scholarship and political awareness on the subject has deepened and broadened. And it has also become an issue of public concern, you know, as, is, as, as things happen in democracy. Let, let me offer some personal insight here. Two young reporters, my own colleagues from Kantipur and Kathmandu Post, Narayan Wagle, who you know very well, and Jogendra Ghimire, walked for days to arrive at remote, remote Kalapani in 1996. They wrote a series of groundbreaking stories to bring the border dispute to the national limelight. Two other young reporters, Sudhir Sarma and Ganesh Katri, so there is now the editor of Kantipur again, also analyzed the ground situation, having traveled to the region around the same time. But the major credit perhaps should go to Prem Singh Dhami, you know, who was the MP from the region, Darjula, uh, a UML MP. Uh, he was the first one to raise this in parliament and the reporters felt it was time for them to follow it up on the ground. That's, that's in the picture of the then MP. So I would say, uh, uh, you know, uh, now Nepal was 
an open society, society or democracy. And the parliament was a venue where these things came up when they were not allowed in doing the bonsai. Now, I also want to offer some broader regional context here as both uh, Professor Muni and, uh, and Mr. Rai has, have already pointed out. The rise of China and its role in South Asia is a new fact of our political lives. As many parts of the world, the Chinese footprint has been obvious in South Asia, especially the last 20 years. It is a major trading partner, not just for Pakistan, who it considers all weather friend, but also for other countries in the region, including India, which has a, a two of them share a very, very huge uh, you know, trade. However, in the larger Indo-Pacific theater, China and India are also competitors. Uh, another point I would like to make, India has outstanding border dispute with India, not just in Ladakh, in the West and Arunachal, but also in the middle sector where Kalapani lies. And India has been upgrading its military logistics, border posts, etc., roads for a long time, you know, from what I have read of English, uh, sorry, um, Indian press. Now my sense is that the Kalapani complication is part of the larger military expansion on the part of India. And India seems to have overlooked the fact that it could face such a strong backlash from Nepal. Now this begs a question, why did New Delhi and Beijing discuss? What did they discuss when they signed an agreement in 2015 to open the disputed Lipu Lake Pass? Nepal deserves transparency in this regard, to say the least. On why now the Kalapani flashpoint, I've already offered some thesis above. I would like to add one more. China's annual national Congress is in session now as we talk. Did China or perhaps even India wanted to ratchet it for border issue for domestic consumption? I don't know. And I saw a tweet last night where a Nepali professor who was based in Delhi, is, uh, sorry, in, in China, who can read the Chinese press, Chinese language press, he said that the Kalapani dispute between India and Nepal is a big story in the Chinese language media in China, not so much in the English, lang English language media. And you can very well guess where, which side China is on. I found that very interesting, though I need to verify this independently at some point. Still, I would like to argue that Nepal has still, Nepal still holds some diplomatic leverage over both China and India. China considers, and then in, in, this can be very clear in my, has been very clear in my conversation, private and otherwise with Chinese officials, its border with Nepal settled since the 60s border agreement, unlike with India or even Bhutan, far smaller country. Uh, we have to understand this, however, Unlike during the 2015-16 border blockade by India, when Nepalese clearly saw India as an insensitive neighbor and China a possible savior, Nepali perception of China this time is a bit more nuanced. Many in Nepal's political circle and the strategic community are now asking. China now says it has nothing to do with the Kalapani dispute, and yet it did sign an agreement with India on the issue of Lipu Lake in 2015. So which of the two is actual Chinese story? Is China, is China telling us the true story? Is it telling us the whole story? Nepalese are looking for more assurances than the prime minister's recent claim in parliament that, that he's assured that Nepal, uh, he's, he's assured by Chinese assurance that they have nothing to do with the border issue and India and Nepal need to settle it between themselves. Now, also, another question, you know, is Nepal's ties is independent? Is Nepal's ties with India is independent of its ties with India or not? It's time to Nepalese, it's time for Nepalese to ask this question, you know. Now, this brings us to why Nepali public is so, so disturbed over Kalapani. You may say, one may argue, it's just a 235 kilo, square kilometer of a rugged remote land with very little economic value, with a very with only a few hundred people who live there, all the stakeholders in India, in China, and the outside world would do well to realize the central tenet of Nepal's foreign policy, as argued 
by Professor Leo Rose back in 1971. I quote, because of Nepal's preoccupation with mere survival, its foreign policy inevitably has a psychological orientation different from that of larger neighbors, including India and China, whose physical attributes are in themselves a fairly reliable guarantee of security. A much smaller Nepal doesn't have that luxury, hence the current national angst. Now here's my final point, and this is how Nepal looks specifically at India at this point in history. India is, like a, India is a democracy, like, just like Nepal, and we share common cultures, history, you know, that, that's, that's given. And because it's an open society, again, much like Nepal, there are many Indians who are willing to listen to us. Some of you are listening to me, some of whom you are my co-panelists. Co now, another important point, the Indian state, you know, has recently helped resolve a long-standing border dispute with Bangladesh. Nepal is a close friend too, if not closer, given our extremely intimate people-to-people -people ties. Tens of Nepali, tens of thousands of our peoples from one side work on the other side, you know, and thousands of others cross border each day to buy simple things as essential commodities, others as pilgrims, and yet others even to get medical treatment. Nepalese have served the Indian army for generations, you know. Let me make a very personal, a bit of a half joke here, you know, but a very telling. I still joke among my friends in Kathmandu who can't really relate to my experience living in a border town, you know, uh, adjacent to Bihar. If I hit, you know, I, I, I used to play cricket, I'm a big fan still. If I hit a four on the point boundary in Bhadrapur High School cricket ground, where I played and learned my cricket, the, the ball would travel to the adjoining town of Galilea, you know, which is in Bihar. It's a very intimate relationship, and yet we have to acknowledge, both of us, it is very complex. And if political dimensions of the relationships are not well handled, we could, have, we could face serious consequences, uh, despite our intimate political ties. Now, we know that India has big power ambitions, and as, as for my, some of my former speakers just said, and it wants its dues in the emerging world order. Now I noted with a degree of comfort at a recent webinar organized by Brookings, Constantino, thank you. When India's former foreign secretary, Siva Sankar Menon, stressed on the primacy of a stable neighborhood in India's foreign policy calculus. Now, I expect Mr. Menon also meant that the growing aspirations of smaller neighbors would also be taken into account when he talks about it. Now, to allow a border dispute to fester at this point in history, when we are facing a pandemic, that's an aside, could lead to renewed stability in the region, could have larger geopolitical implications, not to talk of damage it will have on Nepal-India ties once again after 2015. Uh, finally, to leave the issue unattended is certainly not in Nepal's interest either short term, medium term, and long term. Uh, that's probably, uh, that's, I am done with this. I'll be very happy to take questions if any. Thank, thank you, sir. excellent observations. Just, I want, wanted to say that China has been keeping a transactional point of view with Nepal, unlike India. So, and I don't think in 2015 it was a savior. This is, this is my personal observation. Later on, we, maybe we can discuss about this in next round. For the time being, uh, I'm inviting Dr. Constantino Javier to present his uh, point, uh, point of view. Dr. Javier, Constantino, can, can you hear me, please? Dr. Javier? Yeah, I think. Oh. Ah, okay, got it. Yeah, yeah, you please. You had to unmute me. Thank please you. go ahead. Thank you, Atul. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, the Institute and to Pramoji and to you, Atul, for convening this. Very timely, very important, uh, and wonderful to be in company of good friends, experts, distinguished, and also, I shall say, diverse set of speakers. Uh, I think in the interest of time, Professor Muni already made that point. I'll restrict my uh, intervention to 10 quick statements. 
uh, and then really be open to a so, Constantino. We have time. We have time. You can please take fifty minutes. We have. Time. Okay, I'll be very brief. One, yeah, yeah. Um, what I, and, and there are 10 points, three about the past, three about the present, and four about the future. So you see where my bias is, and I think the focus should be on the future. I told you asked the question before, what are the solutions? And I think this relationship needs solutions more than anything else at this point, rather than past and, and present. But let's go quick to the past, and I'll mix a bit the immediate problem, which is on our minds these days, this immediate border dispute, but also the larger trends in the relationship. Number one, I think, you know, the question really is asked, why has this issue not been solved earlier? Professor Mooney mentioned it. Uh, this goes back decades, if not uh, a century. I mean, this is a long history to this dispute. This is nothing new. And I think we should all ask ourselves, why has this not been addressed uh, at the right uh, forum, at the right level earlier? Why have we allowed this issue? Uh, why have we seen this issue fester on and come to what is really blown up into a full bilateral dispute with, I would say, very nasty comments from both sides. Um, and I think Ambassador Ranjit Rai's comment about this key phrase, complacency, uh, is spot on. Complacency uh, has been, I think, um, festering on uh, in terms of not so much the political relationship, which has been doing quite well. If you look at how many times Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Oli uh, have met, how they have engaged personally, the number of visits, the beautiful symmetry we've seen. I mean, those are all optics that have worked very well. But if you look below at the level of the bureaucratic, diplomatic engagement, I think there's a lot to be desired. So we used to ask for more political engagement in the India-Nepal relationship, say 10, 20 years ago. And I would say now we have too much of it. Uh, there's a, a jumping from politics to politics, meeting to meeting, and the policy track has struggled to keep up with this. Uh, and I think the eminent persons group report is the best example of this. Uh, if both prime ministers of these republics have asked civil society members to come up with solutions, ideas that are not binding, right? These are civil society members who were worked on for three years and have this report ready and then you have this bizarre situation in which both prime ministers don't find the time, and particularly I have to say on the Indian side, don't find the time to receive these non-binding uh, uh, recommendations. I think that's the best example. Number two, why did this issue flare up now? I think it's a mix uh, of many reasons. It's a mix of, I think, you know, there's a question, why did the uh, Indian defense minister announce that road at the time which he did? Uh, was it timed? Was it on purpose? W was it known that this would flare up in Nepal? Uh, was it neglected? Was there miscommunication between the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of External Affairs? Did the Ministry of External Affairs maybe warn the Ministry of Defense that this would create an issue, but then there was a political decision to ignore it because it was more important to announce this wonderful new road for Indian pilgrims, pilgrims at a moment of crisis here in India? I don't know. that we need to ask and find, find, find out further, but for sure we know that the timing was disastrous uh, for the relationship, at least for what we're seeing now, unless of course you wanted this to play out it, the way it is, which I doubt. Uh, and number two, it is certainly linked, and this is I think important, we have to recognize it also, with the political moment in Nepal. Uh, foreign policy and domestic politics are always connected in every country. Every country and every government uses foreign policy issues to strengthen it. We see it in India-Pakistan relations and US-China relations. And I think it's fair to say that what, whether it was intended or not for the government of Nepal and Prime Minister Oli in particular, this issue has come as a lifeline and has emboldened him, emboldened him and has reduced the scope for any of the opposition members uh, to you know, uh, reduce uh, his power and somehow come up with an alternative or uh, um, um, you know, undermine him. Three, um, the role of China. And I, I really think we've spoken too much of China uh, over the last few weeks. Um, I think China is... Hello, Constantino. Hello. Hello. Yeah. We can't hear you, Constantino. Some problem with. Uh, 
Tino's internet. Oscar Tino, can you hear us? Uh, there is, I think there is some technical difference. In the meantime, can we start with uh, Ms. Apeksha, sir? Apeksha, Apeksha, Ji, please. Uh, thank you, Anuji. I think uh, he's back. I think you, he wants to talk. He's back. Constantly. First time, first time, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's back. He, he want, you need to unmute him. Yeah. From Ramoji, please unmute him. Yeah. yeah, please, please continue. No. That uh, mm. uh, the the rise of China is the particular in the in the yeah. region because it is a rise of an authoritarian state. Constantly, so there was a pause. Constantly, there was a pause. Correct. For a while. Yeah. You got to go. Please, so I was speaking about the... China. That was my third point. And the rise of China brings in a particular political influence. It is an authoritarian political influence that is not comfortable with pluralism, with rule of law, with multi-party democracy. And I think you know all of us have to be very careful about that. But I think in Nepal, in particular, there should be a particular concern about that. Um, in particular during these moments of crisis. Uh, number four, um, on the conflict itself and the dispute, um, you know, the, on the ground, every inch of territory that Nepal is claiming is in, in Indian possession. Um, and I don't think that will change anytime soon because of the power, the forces, the military deployments, and just India's real, obviously, in, uh, unwillingness to vacate any of this land. It's an important uh, military issue for India. It's also an important pilgrimage and religious uh, route, uh, but also an important uh, um, uh, trade route uh, if and when relations with uh, China improve. So I think there, there's a clear st status in terms of Indian possession. So you know that is the pragmatism we have to have. And I think uh, however much we want to change that, I don't see much possibilities for that to change immediately, at least in the short and medium term. Fifth. We see now uh, element of escalation and um, on both sides and a face off really between both sides where I don't see any side blinking and waiting actually for the other side to blink. And that's, you know, sad um, because it's really a, a negative spiral in the relationship. That's what we have reached. Um, I think by the day that is happening, I mean, you saw the statement of, by an MEA official yesterday saying that uh, Nepal has taken a maximalist position, which may even foreclose the possibility or make dialogue more difficult, which is understandable. But I think, as far as I know, there's, again, in Delhi, no departure, so I hope, and so I've seen, from what we saw in the NEA statement from two weeks ago, saying that dialogue is the only way, even if later at some point after this COVID crisis. But I think also we should be very careful because escalation, you know, can lead to new positions on the Indian side and on the Nepali side. And I would caution on the Nepal side that, you know, uh, you know, India is in a difficult situation now. It will have to prioritize this issue. I think there's a realization about this. A dialogue will have to happen sooner rather than later. There may be a political signal, there may be a diplomatic signal, but it's very di difficult to get off these escalatory ladders for both sides. Prime Minister Oli will not want to show that he is weakened, that he somehow had to give in nor would someone like Prime Minister Modi be willing to show some type of weakness. So it will require a lot of magnanimity, a lot of generosity, a lot of foresight from both leaders to get off these letters. Um, uh, sixth, um, this irritant is going to be very costly in the long term to the relationship. And that's already, I think, a clear uh, conclusion uh, into week three of this escalation. Um, this will cost the relationship. I think Professor Mooney mentioned that very clearly. Uh, these are not issues that you can switch on and off. They rally up people's beliefs, feelings. They leave a bad impression on both sides. They reduce trust and confidence in both governments and bureaucracies. So I think this will cost, is already costing the relationship in the long term uh, and is therefore very worrisome. Um, three last, four last points, positives now, um, or at least solutions. Number one, the success in the long term, like Professor Mooney said, and I think absolutely right, is on the interdependence and connectivity and mutual knowledge of both these societies. I think this assumption that India and Nepal are closed because they have open borders is actually betrayed by the lack of information, lack of studies, lack of new generations that are actually exposed to each other and meeting each other. And that's why these seminars like today are very important. You know that I've said this to some of you, I'm puzzled about how few Nepali speakers we get here in Delhi in the think tank scene. 
it's amazing. We get Americans, we get Australians, we get Japanese speakers. And I find it absolutely uh, scandalous, I have to say, when I arrived in Delhi 2016 to see uh, an almost absent Nepal on the foreign policy academic circuit. It's, hap it's improving, but we have much more to do on that. Two, another solution I think we have to look coming now more to the short term is there has to be an engagement uh, of civil society, uh, and that speaks to that. Um, uh, and, you know, we will have, and I'll come then to the third positive step, a face saving mechanism in the short term, whether it's in the next few days or weeks, whether it means both prime ministers coming out, whether it means a minister in India making a statement, whether it means on the Nepali side a move, whether it means foreign secretary meeting sooner rather than later, there'll be an immediate governmental signal. But that has to be complemented by a civil society, uh, intellectual engagement on both sides from people beyond government of well wishes of this relationship that will have to come on the Lipolik dispute, in particular Kalapani dispute, with some type of innovative solution. Uh, because no side is going to give up. Uh, and the only you know, thing that history shows us in these protracted sovereign disputes is that they're going to escalate and fester on. We see it on India-China for the last decades uh, on the border dispute. Or there is a momentum often coming from outside government, a track 1.5, track 2 people that get engaged and really come with very concrete solutions focused on trade, people's movement, joint sovereignty, joint management, demilitarization. I mean, there's a whole range of literature suggesting very concrete steps that have been successfully implemented worldwide, sometimes in, in you know, much more complex, hostile disputes between two states, which is not the case of India and Nepal. So I see tremendous potential there. Last, and I'll end with this, you know, in any special relationship, whether it's a marriage, a partnership, two states like India and Nepal, and, or any relationship, forget the special, if you're not comfortable with that, there's always a spectrum or the specter of third actors and third parties uh, in any form. Um, there are always temptations, there are interventions, interferences, diversifications. Uh, and I think here, uh, China is an important factor and is in many ways, you know, a principle, I would say, in this issue, in this dispute, uh, in particular in the Lipolik dispute, for many technical reasons that have come up in the last few weeks. But let me also stress something that I've been, you know, uh, repeating over the last few years is that there's a world be beyond India and China. And there's a world beyond India and China that is of particular interest to Nepal and of particular importance to Nepal. You don't want to be caught up between these two giants. They offer tremendous markets and opportunities. They're your two immediate neighbors. They'll be always the two most important countries for Nepal. But for China, for India, but in, for Nepal in particular, uh, there are a variety of other countries that are engaged now in Nepal uh, that need to be... Um, uh, uh, listen to carefully and are, 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 I think, very important actors in the future development of Nepal uh, and the future decisions Nepal will be taking, whether it's on connectivity, development, and even its political governance models in the future. I'm thinking of many countries. I'm thinking of Japan. I'm thinking of Australia. I'm thinking of Southeast Asian countries, the Koreans who've been stepping up in terms of their program in Nepal. Uh, I'm thinking of the Gulf countries, which there's a special relationship with Nepal of the United States, obviously, but also the European countries and the European Union in particular. Uh, so there's a whole world out there which I think uh, uh, needs to be engaged also. I'll end at this. Thank you. Wonderful, Dr. Wissens. Thank you, uh, Mr. So We really have to come out from China, China psychosis, no doubt about it. Second thing, uh, we also have to admit that there has been no written record on, on this particular issue. So whenever the Forest of level meeting happens, there should be a consideration on this particular point that there has to be something in written because the same problem will not occur again and again in future. Thank you. Now I will invite uh, Ms. Apeksha Asa, she is the assistant professor at Drew University. Apeksha Asa, please. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Atul. Yeah. And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, NICE for organizing this event, and I'm truly honored to be participating among such uh, distinguished uh, speakers. And I do agree, people-to-people -people dialogue like these do help clearing intentions among states or misunderstandings among states. Uh, now, a lot already has been said uh, in Nepal in their relations and about the current uh, conflict. Uh, now, India Nepal relation is definitely a one to cherish the open border, the 
interconnectedness and the people-to-people -people relation is uh, definitely a unique one in the region. Now, coming to the current dispute, uh, it has been an ongoing issue. Um, it basically origins from the, at the heart of the dispute is basically the origin of the river Kali. Now, the Nepali side, as per the Treaty of Sugoli, believe that uh, the river is supposed to be the westernmost border, but there seems to be a disagreement regarding the origin of the river. And it, it is a technical issue and uh, it needs to be solved diplomatically. Um, and like I said, it's a long-standing issue. I do not want to go too back in the past because past at times is not as transparent and the context of that time might be very different than what we have become accustomed to at present. And also uh, context within countries, within regions change over the years, like again, already mentioned by our speakers. Um, so even that has to be kept in mind. But since 1990s, there was an agreement between the two countries that the point of conflict, these three points that we are sort of having a dispute right now, was a contested territory. Uh, there were diplomatic initiations made to resolve the conflict uh, without any conclusion. Till 2014, there seems to be an agreement from both the parties that it is a disputed territory. However, since 2015, there seems to be a shift in the narrative from the Indian side, if my reading is correct. Now, the agreement that was signed in 2015 between India and China does refer to the disputed uh, territory and <coughs> Nepal uh, did uh, sort of, you know, uh, send uh, protest notes to both the countries. And as per my understanding, uh, the Indian side did, has not uh, did not respond. Now, through such actions and inactions post-2015, there seems to be a shift in the fact that somewhere the Indian establishment is not admitting or not showing that much of response to the border dispute and to resolving it. And then coming to 2019, again, the map has already been spoken about. The Indian side came up with a new map. Nepali side put up reservations, uh, said they want to hold negotiations. Uh, now, again, if my readings are correct, uh, I understand that uh, Delhi responded maybe because of Corona or something. Again, the talks could not happen, could not conclude. Now, after a few months, uh, amidst a global pandemic, when there is more cooperation required in the world, unprecedented times in history and India chose to inaugurate a road in a disputed territory. Now definitely this was going to raise alarm and it did and again the Nepal side rebuked uh, the Indian side answered that it was their territory, the Nepal side endorsed a map, the, the India side has said that they don't agree to the claim. So again we're back to square one that there is a dispute in the territory and that needs to be resolved. Having said that this uh, conflict at hand I feel signifies a greater change or greater misunderstandings that have come between the nation since 2015. And also the impasse right now is a result of not coming to the negotiating table or not taking uh, the negotiations or diplomatic channels more seriously, given that that's what happens. The, you know, the positions is going to harden and the impasse is, you know, the positions of both the parties are gonna be, is going to become more rigid as time goes by. Now, having said that, the other uh, thing since 2015, I think the Indian establishment and Nepal uh, relationship has dipped, of course, because of what happened during the constitution promulgation. The reservation that came from the Indian side did not sit very well with the Nepali people. Now, there is no denying that India has always supported uh, democratic movements in Nepal. They believe, I think the people in Nepal do believe that India does respect uh, the voices of the people and our democratic process. However, the reservation during that time did sort of erode the trust between the two partners. And since then, the relationship has not sort of been the same. Now, another thing that has to be noticed that the promulgation of Nepal's constitution marks a new era for the Nepal's domestic context also. Now, from 1990 till 2015, there was a lot of political turmoil in the country, and that's quite evident. And due to that, a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, agendas or a lot of goals, let's say something like economic development or prosperity, were sort of hijacked by this political turmoil. So 2015 and the promulgation of the constitution also sets a new plate for the domestic context. Now there is an agreement that economic prosperity and development is what Nepal needs to sort of pursue. So even this is a context that cannot be avoided. 
Now, even regionally, there has been a change during that this time. Uh, the fact that China has come out of its hide and bite policy and has been quite vocal about wanting to play a bigger role in the region. Uh, a similar intention is declared from the Indian side also. Of course, countries like Nepal would want to make advances, more would want to make arrangements to, you know, secure resources for their national goal. Now, of course, uh, like, I, you know, they're obvious why, you know, Nepal-China relations can be viewed negatively. And of course, the transit treaty between uh, Nepal and China also came in 2016 at a very unfortunate times, given that uh, Nepal-India relations were at all the time low. But regardless of that, for a landlord country like Nepal, it is obvious to want connectivity to both of its neighbors. Now, in that perspective, all of these changes have to be kept in mind. And also, I would like to state that even India and China have a relationship. There are points of divergence, of course, but there are points of convergence also. So everybody in the region do have relations to view it against Nepal India, like you know, Nepal China relations to view it anti Nepal India relation might be an unfair judgment. Uh, now, I think these are the misunderstandings, the change context that has not been able to be grasped by both parties have led to where we are today, uh, the confrontation. And I think it is time to consider why. Like, again, this has already been brought up. Like, they're very good friends. Why these issues have arose? The issues have arose because something is not going right. And maybe that something is how the two countries have been dealing with each other. And again, I would like to bring up uh, the issue of EPG here. Because technical committees like EPG does sort of depoliticize issues. It is more transparent. It is more legitimate. And that and any transparency is the key out here because a lot of uh, diplomatic dealings between the two countries have not been as transparent. And I think moving forward, I think two countries should agree to have different platforms, maybe rethink what has been going wrong, understand the changed context regionally, domestically in both countries, in the third country also, including China, and then see how you can move forward. Maybe people-to-people -people dialogues are required, maybe organizational and institutional relations need to be strengthened. So newer, transparent, more uh, diplomatic and technical um, way forward might do well. Um, I think I should stop here. I think a lot has already been said, but I would like to conclude by saying that if countries in the region want to play a bigger role, then they need to be ready to take on bigger responsibilities. You have to, like, you know, somewhere the countries have to support the rule-based international order that we have created because it works in the best interest of everybody. And the hardening of position today that we see between the countries has because has is, is there because of diplomatic failures. So I'm sure it will do well while moving forward. We would look for newer platforms, maybe see what has gone wrong in the past, maybe less politicization, more transparency might gain the trust between the two countries because you know there seems to be a lack of trust at the moment. But then again, you know, we've always had these ups and downs between Nepal and India, and I'm sure that two countries will find a way out and this would be resolved as well. I think I would uh, stop there. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Abhijal. This to self us, for sure. Uh, before we'll open uh, the floor for question and answer, we have 10, 12 minutes. And as a follow-up, uh, I, I would like to invite Professor Ashley Muni for, for, a speak, for a speak for about two, three minutes. Sir. Professor Muni, sir. Can we hear from you, sir? Okay. Am yeah. I audible now? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, Atul, I didn't know that, and Pramod also, I didn't know that this session is only on uh, Kalapani, and it, it seems to have been reduced to this. Yes. I thought we were talking the totality of India-Nepal relations. That's why I mentioned so little on on Kalapani. No, sir, nothing, like, nothing like it. So you can speak of the totality. Now, okay. Now, that's what I say. I earlier thought, that's why my uh, comments were very brief. Anyway, yeah. the first question which Atul, you raised on this was India, China has officially refuted and yes. have uh, a, uh, can ro look, the Nepalese are asking for a trilateral dialogue. Not we are, we are not asking for it. Right. We have said the Chinese influence may be working behind Nepal in picking up the issue. We haven't said that we want Nepal-China on the border. Now look at it from India-China angle. 
uh, which partly Ranjit has said, Akhilesh has also mentioned very rightly. At this moment, there is a tension between India and China. And so far as China is concerned, it is not only in 2015 that they have accepted Lipulek as a contact point between India and China. They accepted it in 1954. Please go to the Peaceful Coexistence Agreement and you will find that eight or nine places. 18, 18, sir, 18 bases. They allowed 18 bases actually. No, 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 no. Please listen. Not uh, Joe, whatever the places are, Lipulek is one of them. Yes, yes, of course. Between, between India and China. Right. Now, right. in 54, nobody raised this issue. Right. 30, after 2015, uh, everybody is saying that how come India has done this kind of an agreement. So, this is not a new agreement. This was the Chinese position earlier. In addition to that, I heard Prakash Loheni in one of the interviews, he says the first border mark between China and Nepal starts with Lipu Lake. So your trijunction is in Lipu Lake. No, if no, Tinker Pass. Tinker. Well, well, okay. So it is in down below there. Yeah, Tinker Pass. Okay, if that is true, then if if you know Limpu Adhara is the that area is yours, what happened to that border with China? Why was it not guarded? Now the, now, now the Indian posts in Nepal, again, they say, oh, it came up in 1961. Oh, no, 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 sorry. It is started with an agreement with Matrika Babu in 1954. And it was a mutual agreement in the context of a communist China rising. Both were concerned with their security. And they wanted Nepali military to be modernized. There was a military modernization mission from India posted in Nepal. Under that agreement, all the Nepal-China border posts were moved to be manned by the Indian officers. It was these border posts which in 1969, Kirti Nidhi Bista asked to withdraw. So these posts were withdrawn. But India mentioned its own post on Lipu Lake vis-a-vis -vis China, which was not the part of military modernization mission. There was no question of withdrawing it. Therefore, it was not withdrawn. You know, all kind of things have been said about uh, the, the way border has evolved. Look, we will need almost two, three hours only to discuss border with a lot of documents. They are all with me. I have the, the original text of 1916, uh, 1816 uh, Sogoli Treaty. And I dare say that reading all the documents, there were four or five mutual exchanges before the, uh, before the treaty was finalized in 1860, not 16. Correct. Because whatever was written in 1816 was changed because the king of Nepal wanted some more territory. And that was added in Tarai. I mean, I, if, I, I, I thought, let me not go into this, you know, depth of history, uh, which will take, take the issue away from it. But if you are discussing history, now today, I understand there is a petition before Supreme Court of Nepal. And Supreme Court of Nepal has asked government of Nepal to produce older maps. What, what is the map which Nepal produced to the United Nations? Have a look at that. What is the map which was produced by Nepal earlier? Have a look at that. This is for the first time Nepal is making a map without a survey. Yes. Now, therefore, right. you see, uh, I mean, I, I know I get a lot of abuses from my very dear Nepali friends. Because I say things which may not be palatable to them. But my dear, this is the hard fact which I see in the documents and papers. So why should I not bring it to your, your knowledge and your, your attention? So if you go into the Kalapani dispute, you know, the Ranas, uh, I was in a panel discussion with Ashok Mehta, General Ashok Mehta. And I had a lot of yes. discussion with Rishikesh Shah. Rishikesh Shah told me there are maps which are signed by the Ranas and the British authorities, which show the whole Kalapani into the British area, British Indian area. Now, if we are going, and, 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 and uh, Ashok Mehta said he has one of the copies of those maps. Now, if you go by these maps, how do you undo history? The Nepalese position is strongly attached to the 1816 version of the treaty. The Nepalese position does not go into the details of how it evolved during the Rana period and why did even the Shahs, I mean, why until 1980, nobody in Nepal asserted because they knew these were the parts of the history which they will have to prove. 
Inder Gujarat, who was very kind to me, he was the one who appointed me ambassador. He, we were discussing one day and he said, I have told the Nepalese friends, Kalapani is yours. You produce proper uh, documentation of your possession of that area. It never was. Now, this is where the problem arises in which we have got into this present uh, discussion. And I think, look, there are facts, there are maps, there are treaties, there are agreements, there are revenue records, there are citizens. Uh, even today, if you go to the area, most of uh, the people uh, living in Kalapani uh, will have uh, uh, either uh, uh, Indian Aadhaar card or Indian Russian card and they don't depend on the Nepalese state. Forget mm -hmm. about that. So exactly. all of, both the sides will have all kind of documents. Let us sit down on the table and let us bring about a solution rather than going bravado. That now something we will create, which I mean, the, the Nepal is all gaga at creating a new map. How do you create a map without surveying the ground? I mean, this is for the first time happening in the history uh, that without surveying the ground properly, we are drawing up the maps. There is a blame which even uh, Apeksha said that uh, we issued, uh, and, and I think Akhilesh said, we issued a new map in, in 2019 November. In 2019 November map, there is a no alteration of our border with Nepal. The 2019 map was exclusively focused on showing a union territory status for Jammu and Kashmir. Sir, sir, sir there is a question. Us. Sir, there is a question for you. There is an observation from Mr. Salad. Okay, I'll, I'll take the questions you tell me later. I'll sir, let, sir, let me. So just one is... minute. Just... Okay. He's, he's, okay, saying okay. That, he's saying that, Professor Muni, it was you who gave Gujarat doctrine accommodating neighbors' interests. Yes, we, I, even today, stand for accommodating all the neighbors. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with my horse throat, I'm saying we must sit down and talk and resolve. I'm not saying we must battle with Nepal. I'm not asking Nepal to battle with India. And I think that was one of the, we, I did not give the doctrine. Yes, we discussed this draft. We, I was involved at, at some stage in, in, in some sort of consultations, yes. And I even today stand for, you know, the India, India, India Nepal Koirala Foundation idea was given by me. India yeah. Sri Lanka Foundation idea was given by me. I made the first draft of that. So I am for good neighborliness. I even today, I have criticized India's policy towards neighbors. I have said Modi's neighborhood first policy utterly failed within months. Yes, sir. So that's not yes. a problem with me. Okay? Yeah. Anyway, yes. so therefore my only submission to all of you is that please you let us not marshal historical facts. Let us leave historical facts to the authorities. It is the state which is important. Scholar is not important. Today, I come at a position that will not decide India-Nepal relations. The state of India and Nepal will decide India-Nepal relations. So let us plead with our, our governments, please sit down and talk before rushing to the conclusions or asserting your position. Exactly. Exactly. And that would, that would be my position even on Kalapani number one. Number two, yeah. you know, there are several areas. I mean, 1950 treaty revision, EPG issue, which has come. Incidentally, EPG report is technically incomplete because my very dear former student and, and very junior fellow, uh, uh, Upreti, who was a part of the EPG group, is no more. And before his death, he could not sign the document. Therefore, the document is incomplete. You like it or not, technically speaking. And I think any government can depend on that as an excuse. Forget about that. But in EPG, 1950 treaty is being revised. All the Nepalese are saying, let us put barbed wire, stop this open border. Okay, wonderful. 1950 treaty has a language and a structure. I agree with you that some of the language and the articles have become redundant today. There's no doubt about it. And they need to be revision. But when we sit down for revision, and, and India has said several times, again, even uh, uh, I.K. Gujarat said, okay, we are willing to revise the treaty. So if we have to revise the treaty, let India and Nepal decide whether we want to change the basic structure of mutual interdependence or we only want to change some of the uh, uh, languages and phrases which are offensive to the Nepalese side or which are not acceptable to the Indian side. No problem. If you want to change the language, the whole process would be done within a week. 
if you give it to me. Right, so thank, thank you very okay. much. But yeah, if you want to change the structure, then you decide yeah. what sort of relationship do you want to continue with an interdependence relationship with India, or you want an autarky vis-a-vis -vis India. Because now you have friends, you have new transit lake. Apeksha said new transit uh, route to China, wonderful, technically. My dear, this is a political point. This is not an economic point. The moment you start transiting through the Chinese route, the prices of your products will go fourfold up. Are your consumers willing to buy them? Are your businessmen ready to do that? Therefore, that was made a wonderful political point. I think this was Oli's master stroke. That look, we are independent. But it is a political point. It is not an economic relationship. And why it is that the economic relationship of trade, which was around 40-45% 20 years earlier, has today become 60-69%. The interdependence is increasing, but politically we want separation from each other. See, unless you set your politics right, the economic relations and developmental relations would never improve. Therefore, look at it seriously. Okay, yes. I think we conclude here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, there is a question for Mr. Uh, I'm 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 Mr. Ranjit, sir. Uh, there is a question from Asuko Sanan. He's saying that, that my question is regarding the timing of the escalation. When China is facing backlash from the entire world, owing to its role in hiding coronavirus outbreak, and it is somewhat isolated, it is making Nepal escalate dormant, dormant border dispute with India. The kind of escalation from where it would be nearly impossible for Nepal to back down. Ambassador Ray, the question is for you, sir. Yeah, thank you. No, you know, I also thought that we were going to discuss, uh, you know, India-Nepal relations in, timing, much, timing is in a much broader context. Yes. And if we wanted to discuss it only in the context of Kalapani, then of course it's a different debate, uh, as Professor Muni said. And the second point I wanted to also make is right now, I think we are underestimating the impact of COVID. Do we know how COVID is going to impact yes. uh, on our economies and the huge humanitarian uh, disaster uh, that is happening because of COVID? And, you know, I'm, uh, I find that there's just no discussion uh, about this uh, issue at all uh, in, in our conversation. And, you know, maybe uh, at some future date, I think it's absolutely critical. This is the most important challenging fa challenge facing both countries. On the Kalapani issue, just one or two points. I think reference was made to how this has become, you know, in a democracy issue, raised up, it's a people's issue and so on. I mean, I, I, I was not part of the EPG process. Now, I don't know if, you know, this issue finds mention uh, in the EPG report as something uh, extremely critical uh, to be resolved. So, you know, I haven't seen the report. I'm not a member. And just two points. I mean, Professor Muni referred to it, but, you know, I have questions. You know, would our friends from Nepal tell us where boundary pillar number one is between China and Nepal? And I asked a second question, when was the last time that the map of Nepal was revised? You know, before this uh, new map was published, when was that old map actually introduced and for how long uh, uh, has it uh, uh, survived? And as far as uh, 1954 Panchil agreement between China and India, you know, the border trade and also the pilgrimage has always been happening along this route. And there has never been any problem. And, you know, what I know from our uh, uh, experience, I mean, I, I don't know exactly where, but there was a police post uh, in Kalapani well before uh, the uh, paramilitary force uh, uh, was established. One or two more points. I think absolutely we, you know, if there are problems in the relationship, we have to address those and we have to step up our engagement. Critical, it, you know, it's critical to have the engagement at the state to state level. And I think, you know, there has been a, a unnecessary delay in both the acceptance of the EPG report and the foreign secretary level talks. You know, I think this should happen. But obviously, this will happen in a positive atmosphere. It cannot happen in an atmosphere when, you know, there is so much mistrust and uh, the, the, the state of relations uh, is bad. So clearly, something needs to be done to improve this atmosphere uh, and the environment uh, for these talks uh, to be held. Number two, absolutely much more intensified engagement at every level. 
you know, you'll be surprised how many of our parliamentarians have not been to Nepal. They know very little about Nepal. So we need to have more exchanges at every level, youth, civil society, media, parliamentarians, you know, the Bipi Korala Foundation that Professor Muni mentioned. So we really need to invest, you know, uh, think tanks. We really need to, to invest uh, 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 in this relationship and really step up our engagement. Because, you know, my worry is that over the years, we are drifting in different directions. And, you know, our priorities have, you know, tend to be different. So it's very important uh, to, 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 you know, really strengthen this, uh, 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 you know, strengthen this uh, 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 neighborhood policy. So I think I'll stop there. And I, I can't, I don't see this question that you're referring to. Timing of the escalation. Yeah, to you, sir. Huh? Yeah, to you, sir. You, you can please answer that. Which is, this is... So anyway, I'll respond. I mean, I, I, I don't know. There are a lot of okay. questions. So I don't okay. in, the in the meantime, in the meantime, there is a question from Major General Binoj Basnir. Pramodji, can you please unmute him? Pramodji? Unmuted. Unmuted. Yeah. Major General Binoj Basnir, sir. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Please. Ask your question uh, and please actually, uh, refer to whom you want to ask. Rather than a question, uh, I have two okay, observations. Uh, I have two observations. And one is, you know, in Nepal-India relationship, we have always had low and high. Uh, so, but uh, the interests of uh, uh, India and the political parties had had low to high. Now, the changes have come from high to low. Uh, you've taken the example of like uh, the 1990 uh, people's movement, uh, the interests of India and the political parties for democracy was uh, taken place. So it went from low to high. Same with the uh, when King Andrews take over of the, uh, of the government. 12 point agreements followed by the peace process. But now it so, it's, it so comes that uh, uh, 2015 when the promulgation of the constitution happened, and this, now the border issues have brought out uh, points that uh, uh, the uh, relationship has gone from high to low. And my second observation is, uh, you know, like, uh, um, uh, I mean, the, Ch the Chinese always comes to talk whenever we talk about any nations of South Asia now because of their interest in the market, in the markets of 1.6 billion people or whether you talk about CPEC or uh, BCIM or the Himalayan transmission uh, line and or like India positions itself as the emerging world power, growing middle class and the growing economy. Now, when we are talking about China and South Asia, particularly Nepal now, uh, militar, militari militarization is happening in the Himalayan region, both countries. Uh, but could it be a message from China saying that uh, your relationship with the United States and the Western world vis-a-vis -vis Tibet, uh, we would be there to interfere with other smaller nations that, so that uh, India is more, has more concentrations with the smaller nations in its neighborhood than concentrate on China. That's, uh, thank you. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pramoji, can, can you please uh, unmute Mr. Ambassador Vishnu Prakas? He has a comment to make. Ambassador Vishnu Prakas. Pramoji. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and greetings. I have heard the comments with great interest. Uh, I was director Nepal in MEA from 94 to 97. And I'm taking a broader overview of uh, the relationship. You know, one heard the same arguments, same concerns, same discussions. Now, is it because, the, well, the only difference now is that the tone has gotten sharper. Is it because we are taking each other for granted? Is it that we have, it's an issue of over familiarity? What, what exactly is this? Because, you know, 
pardon my saying that, and I, I am talking of both sides, we seem to be going around in circles. Now, take the 1950 treaty, which has uh, been referred to very regularly by Nepal, or used to be. I know that when we wanted to discuss it, there used to be no discussion. So is it trust gap? What, what is the issue? And are we kind of destined to continue dis talking past each other? I want, uh, if possible, a comment from my Nepalese friends. What would be the three or four things that you would like uh, effectively uh, to see India do so that we can uh, rebuild trust and come out of this cycle of talking past each other? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Akhilesh, sir, over to you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Okay, I would broadly say this, you know, I mean, I would also, in, in, in this respect, partly respond to Mr. Rai and Professor Muni's concern, whether it's a Kalapani issue, the, a discussion about just Kalapani issue or a broader issue. I, I saw the Kalapani issue as a flashpoint, you know, as we call it journalism news peg, to talk about broader issues. But a Kalapani issue, as it's happening, you know, it's unavoidable. Okay, now to respond to the broader question, and I did uh, talk to uh, Atul and ask, you know, what is going to be the main thrust? And then said, you could ask, you could start up with Kalapani. Now, responding to your, broadly to your question, I think I, I still believe, even in this Kalapani thing, as much as Professor Muni has said that he has historical documents, you know, we can, Nepali side also has. You know, at least from what I have listened up to them, you know, in my private interviews, but also the discussions on television lately. Uh, there is even a belief that, I'll come to your question in a bit. There is even a belief in Nepal that it's good that Nepal has come up with a bottom line at all. And we will see how it goes from here. And Nepal, again, according to the Nepali side's position, sticks to the position that 1860, 1816, Sugoli Treaty, which treats uh, uh, Kali as the border river, uh, is the only document that has been ratified for the both sides. All the documents are subsidiary to that, all the correspondence, et cetera. So that's been the uh, 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 position of the Nepali side. Now, I will take it back. You know, I'm not a cartographer, and I don't want to indulge in long, long discussion about maps. As much as we talk about cartography about this, I'll call it a cartographic aggression to put the, uh, you know, uh, Indian, uh, Indian MEA, MEA's lexicon, it is a political issue at the end of the day. We'll, we'll have to look for a political settlement. Now, going back to your question about what are two or three things, two or three things that Nepal wants India addressed, I think one of the things Nepal want, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, was in response to uh, 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 former Foreign Secretary um, Menon's, uh, uh, Menon's uh, idea that it wants uh, India believes in primacy of a stable, immediate neighborhood or the neighborhood first as. Uh, Modi first uh, came up with. In that respect, we, Nepal, wants India to take us in its foreign policy calculus. You know, the, the reason that EPG is important is we see that there is respect for the work done. Of course, it's at, at a civil society, uh, civil society level. And internal, internalizing these facts that smaller nations, those way they look at foreign policy priorities will have insecurity, deep-seated insecurity at the end of the day. And perhaps the foreign policy uh, establishment, not just the foreign policy state establishment, but also the track two diplomacy or 1.5, you know, whatever you may call it, there need to be greater engagement so that Nepali aspirations is embodied in the way Nepal looks at its immediate neighborhood. Sir, can, can I interject? I'm, I'm so sorry, with all due respect, allow me to interject. 
just to say that uh, Mr. Menon certainly has a point of view. I am requesting you and my Nepalese friends to kindly spell out one, two, three. What would you like? I mean, you know, uh, as, uh, let's not talk in abstract terms because if we want to understand how to proceed further, then I guess uh, the viewpoints need to be spelled out a little more clearly, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, Apex said may probably want to take it also, but I will put it this way. For example, this is this current situation has hit a flashpoint. Yeah. The need for negotiation again. You know, I would like to emphasize on diplomacy, definitely at this point in time. And also for the relationship to have a dynamic aspect to it, perhaps Nepal and India need to engage a lot more on the mutual prosperity. For example, Nepal's uh, uh, trade is imbalanced. The trade surplus with India is, India has a huge trade surplus over Nepal. Perhaps it's another area that needs to be addressed. You know, this economic dimension of the relationship. And Perhaps China? Be, sorry? And China? Yeah, Nepal has a trade surplus with China also, uh, sorry, trade deficit with China yes. also. But we don't have to bring in China each, ta each time we talk about Nepal and India, do we, Professor? No, because of the trade uh, surplus. No, then, sir, then we get it from Manu. That, that, then then we get into a economy. Model. It's a factor of economy. Not. It is not political. No, no. Then we get into the old model that Nepal and India have always gotten into, that India takes up oftentimes a very patronizing no, tone in these I, negotiations. What a why let's forget China. Let's concentrate on India, Nepal, please. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, yeah, economic please, prosperity yeah. will give no point Nepal, so India relation China. much needed modern dynamism, you know, it needs, you know. Of course, as I said, I grew up in a border town. There is like what we call the old traditional relationship, but it has to be translated also in economic terms. That will give vitality in the projects that India has started in Nepal. We would like to see completion, see them bear fruits on the ground, you know, that will give much vitality to, to, the, to, to, to the relationship. It's time to kind of like, as much as as we talk about sentiment, which is extremely important for both Nepal and India, it's also time perhaps to give it very, very solid economic impetus. Like Apex has you, you would like to say a few words? Apex right. Thank you, Atul Ji. Uh, right. So I think I've already mentioned, I think the few things that I think moving forward uh, needs consideration is why have things gone wrong? Maybe Nepal side feels a bit disrespected. So there has to be reasons behind that. So I think... Do you have more... three, three points to present right. here? So as I as think, as well. uh, right. So I think the three points, one would be let's resolve the border dispute. The hardening of the position has very much taken place because there was no dialogue. And I'm not trying to say that this encompasses the entire relationship, but this does talk a lot about the issues at like what the present context has been between the two countries. So second is, of course, encourage transparency when it comes to interstate relations. A lot of times in the past, I think uh, lack of transparency, not only from Indian side, even from the party side, political actors. I think if there's um, a need to be more transparent as to what has been being said to the neighbor and what is being committed behind bad doors. And in that, respect, uh, in that perspective, I would say that more technical committees and new platforms can be used. And third is, of course, uh, the reality has changed. Nepal has, uh, you know, like the trade surplus, we're, we're a landlocked country, the economic development has not happened, we've been stuck in a political transition. So it would be nice if our neighbors would help us get the ball rolling and, you know, help us to sort of develop and attain economic cooperation. Uh, I think our Akhilisar wants to say something. Yeah, I'll make a very, sorry. Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll make a very quick, quick point, you know. This COVID pandemic is a godsend opportunity for us. I'm assuming that all of us believe in God here. Sorry <laughs> if some of us don't. Okay, it's a godsend opportunity, I say that. And I was very, very encouraged when Prime Minister Modi took a lead and convened this SARC uh, forum. And, and, and our Prime Minister KP Woli was just out of the uh, surgery, you know, did the kidney transplant, attended it. And I thought he was like pretty decent, his presentation also. Now that's the kind of thing we expect the, from India. If India wants to be seen as a regional leader, behave as one. 
simple. And COVID is the opportunity for India, honestly, as much as it is opportunity for us. You know, we all know this will have an MSRI put it, stress this issue about how bad it's going to be, you know. We are already talking about, you know, the cases spiking up in both India and Nepal. And it is going to take a very bad shape. And yeah. we know, we know India has strength, you know, pharmaceutical. And I, I, I actually tweeted the, the economist uh, editorial some time ago that one of Nepal's great hopes is the vaccine that this Oxford University is producing with Indian pharmaceutical company, you know, because there is this line in the editorial that there is a commitment to also deliver it deliver it to middle income and low income countries. So I see India as a kind of like a kind of magnet in that respect to, to in South Asia at least, but of course even beyond to, to lead from the front at this juncture in history. COVID would definitely, definitely be the opportunity as I said, for both India and us, small yeah. neighbors. Thank you, sir. Thank you. First, you know, uh, there is uh, there are two questions for you. First one from Manish Zankulami. He is saying, as Dr. Javier has mentioned, why this issue has been escalated at the very present time. First, you know, can you please answer this question? Got it. <clears throat> you can hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So, I mean, on, on the timing, I said all I could um, in terms of the analysis I have, uh, we don't know, maybe 20, 30, 50 years from now, we will know when we look at the archives or maybe journalists will find out. Um, <clears throat> I, I, and Kathmandu and Delhi are full of conspiracy theories always. But the most probable, uh, I think the most probable explanation I have, and this is a probability only, is that, you know, uh, India thought it will deal with the fallout of this in Nepal later. That the you know, Minister of Defense thought it was important at this point to announce the road. I don't know, forgot about Nepal, ignored Nepal, ignored advice saying this may hurt the relationship with Nepal. And I think that manifests if that is the case, but I stand to be corrected, obviously. Maybe it was all calculated and strategic from the Indian side, could have been. But if, if what I'm saying is, is correct, it reflects, I think, um, the issue of um, a lack of priority in the neighborhood on issues that matter the most, not the big summits. They are important, they are necessary, but they're not a sufficient ingredient for a healthy relationship with your neighbors. These are the most difficult relationships. That's why, I mean, this is distressing what's happening between India and Nepal, but I'm also not completely alarmed. I mean, like Ambassador Rai and Professor Muni mentioned and, and my other panelists, this is a logic of a relationship that will last, that has its own dynamic, uh, but they take a lot of work. Um, and um, so in terms of the timing, I find it unfortunate, um, but I, I, I don't have more explanation. Let me make two points about, please, about the uh, other speakers. And I'm, I'm so glad Professor Muni gave all the history and the actual uh, uh, facts on the ground and how they have changed and how they make it very difficult for both sides to many, make the arguments, particularly for Nepal. I mean, for all the political uh, 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 case you want to make, these disputes have to be worked out diplomatically, whether it's bilaterally, multilaterally, you can talk about the ICG and about China as much as you want, but there are logic, there's a jurisprudence, uh, there are norms that have to be followed based on uh, many specific indicators, whether cartographic proof, but also proof of use, proof of uh, uh, transit uh, that I, I, I'd be willing, I, I, I want to see that happening because what, only when that happens, I think both sides will be clear. And I would suspect many ways, uh, despite what the government of Nepal may say and has a good case and I've argued in public that, you know, India has neglected, has not heeded to the calls of the Nepali government. But at the same time, very fairly, I think it may not be in the interest of the current government of Nepal and of Prime Minister Oli to, resu to resume the dialogue very quickly. Um, because uh, this uh, you know, will blow off the steam, it will lead to the facts, it will lead to a technical, non-abrasive discussion on which you know, Nepal will face many contrary facts that actually will weaken its position. Two quick points. One is, I've said this before, with greater power 
comes great responsibility, not only with great power, with rising power, you have greater responsibility in managing the foreign policy. Um, and I think Nepal has uh, increased its power, increased its importance uh, in this current world over 20, 30, 50 years ago. It's a pivotal state. It lies between the two largest Asian economies or two largest Asian markets, if you want. Um, but with that comes also the expectation of not ceding into the temptation of politicizing foreign policy. And that is always a temptation. India does the same. You know, all democracies and all democratic governments have to play with that and occasionally play and, you know, and, and try to mobilize people and, you know, push issues that are of national importance. But it's a dangerous game. And I think it's also an unproductive game if you play it too hard. Uh, right. And I think the, the, the work we've seen on diversifying Nepal's foreign policy over the last few years was actually quite good. And this comes a bit of a, sometimes I think could come as a setback. On the Indian side, I have to say, you know, you, we know this old saying, speak softly, carry a big stick. Um, unfortunately, I think in the neighborhood, sometimes we still see the opposite happening on the Indian side. So basically speaking abrasively and speaking hardly and loudly and carrying a very small stick. The small stick is not more geostrategic interference and influence and in all the 19th century geopolitical games of interference. The stick these days is economic leverage, economic interdependence, connectivity. And on that, uh, I'm worried because there, that's where the relationship is, is going to flourish. The second point is, I think we've spoken a lot of negatives and a lot of problems, but you know, there's an old mindset. Um, you know, we've seen yesterday on Times Now, one of the largest TV channels here in India, we saw a retired Indian diplomat uh, very high ranking, uh, yeah. retired, speaking about uh, India needs to get rid of Prime Minister Oli. Uh, India needs to get rid of this Chinese puppet government in Nepal. Um, India needs to send a signal to all countries in the neighborhood that hanging out with China will cost you dearly. I mean, this is not a 20th century mindset. This is a 19th 19th century mindset. Okay. Oh, you are referring to you are referring to the same debate in which Minenda Rizal was the part. No. Uh, Min yesterday Rizal evening. No, no. That was yeah, a yeah. previous no, one on the public TV. Okay. In a, okay. It goes without mention. Uh, this is, I mean, a retired diplomat, so it has it brings in. Mention I think, some the more, name, uh, uh, Tino. What is the problem? It's Ambassador Ambassador Casey Singh, uh, ah, who was yesterday right. on, on, on the Republic TV. Republic TV. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I, we know, fortunately, India's foreign policy is not made in TV studios yet. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, these, it reflects, I think it reflects some, not, not, I think it's unfair to say this is the Indian mentality, but it reflects often still a, a lag in thinking about the neighborhood and, and talking this language, which is completely un counterproductive. It's a language which focuses on the treaty, which is important, on the border issue, which we're talking now, which is important. It focuses on China, which I'm not saying is important. I've mentioned it before. It's concerning for its own rights, for its own reasons. It's a language which speaks about politics and geostrategy all the time. And it's focused on denial, on geostrategy. I like to emphasize the focus on delivery, on connectivity. Let me give you a few examples, which are very important for the relationship. Look at the railway connectivity to India and Nepal. Uh, there is no passenger railway, but it's about to be inaugurated. Finally, the first passenger rail connection between India and Nepal. There okay, used to be a, sorry to interrupt, there used to be a railway line between Jayanagar to Correct. China. Till 2014, meter, meter, meter it's yeah. being renovated now, right. it's almost yeah. ready, which I right. find a fabulous development yeah. because it puzzles me how we still don't have railway connectivity Everything to cut the Everything is there except the trails. Two, roads, road connectivity. I visited the Terai recently. For 15 years, India has been trying to develop an old project, the Hulaki, the postal road. I mean, a disaster in terms of implementation, but many other roads across the, across the border are coming up very well and are very important. Third, integrated check posts. If you look at the Birat Nagar check post, for example, it's an impressive piece of infrastructure. Every trucker in, the, trucker in, that, trucker in, that, region, in that region is easier to trade across that region. Uh, petroleum products pipeline inaugurated for the first time allows you know, petroleum products to access the Nepali market much quicker. Electronic cargo trading system. Today, it's much easier for Nepali products to transit through Haldia and Vizag ports. Uh, and the, the times of transit have been reduced. They've been digitized, has facilitated Nepal's trade, which basically, coming back to what you were discussing before, 
uh, uh, Nepal exports 15 times more to India than to China and imports around 10 times more or seven to 10 times more from India than from China. That's still the scale we're talking about. The foreign minister of Nepal, September last year, visiting the Indian Ocean Conference in the Maldives. Very interesting signal. Nepal is not an Indian Ocean state, but it was present at a very important Indian Ocean Conference because it is interested also in being connected to the Indian Ocean. This goes to the whole Indo-Pacific debate. And I find it very interesting that the foreign minister took the time to be in the Maldives at that conference last year. And finally, you know, students connectivity. Look at the number of students who are still coming from Nepal to India. So that is the language we have to speak. That is the focus. That is what the effort should be focused on. Thank, thank you, Constantine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Akhilesh, do you have anything to? Yeah, I mean, like, just to kind of. Yeah. Especially uh, on the media part. Especially yeah. on the media part. Would you oh, like you mean to like, comment about the reactionary tendencies in Nepalese media as well? We have already covered India part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, very, very candidly. I mean, I, I, in, I, I, in Kathmandu, you know, there, there are newspapers who have different uh, lines and they, they are not much different from Republic TV. So, your take on the same. I would say that the mainstream newspapers, at least the bigger ones, they are more restrained. It's more the, uh, some of the online outlets that have come up often take, uh, you know, very, very strong nationalist position or ultra nationalist position, but also oftentimes not news that are not well filtered, you know. But also you have to understand that social media is very big in our political sphere now, you know. Just about every single, every single major leader I know is in social media. He keeps, he or she, mostly he keeps his opinion immediately, you know, which is oftentimes not in sync with party position, you know. So this kind of, this kind of at times creates confusion. As a consumer of social media, I sometimes have like this very high engagement. I deliberately keep away because I do get sometimes not enlightened, but confused as to what the political position of uncertain things of the party is. But I, I go back to my old point, you know, and then that the, 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 with restoration of democracy, Nepal's media has been very vibrant broadly, you know, and the personal enterprise is very much there in the media. Yeah, I mean, like, of course, compared to Indian media's history, which is like months longer, we may not be still there, but don't forget, I mean, we have seen the Indian channel, which has huge number of audience in Nepal. I mean, like atrocious coverage on this, uh, in, the, in, in, in this issue, on this issue, you know? And I, I don't want to name names of, you know, the members of my fraternity, but name that them, really yeah. doesn't, that doesn't help, you know? Arnab Goswami, classic. I mean, yes, yes. He did, he, did not, he did not even allow two Nepali editors who were hanging on their phone for minutes to speak. And whenever they spoke, he gave them a long lecture on that's what why, That's why we are meeting about. today, for that, that reason also. So, uh, so you, you want to give these guys a say, you know, if you have them on the show. So, yeah, I mean, you may think, sitting in Delhi, these things do not have impact on the way we view India. Oh, Unfortunately, it does. It does influence the public perception of India, you know. And when you, you hear a former foreign secretary, a former foreign secretary in India, we, who we have interacted with, many of them, I keep them generally in very high regard, very major people, bureaucrats who were at the helm of affairs when they were doing things. Many of them are seriously engaged in serious scholarship even now. Comes on the air and says, we're gonna topple the government. And then what do you do? You make Oli government probably even more popular in Nepal that similar misadventure did in 2015, 16. And this is India's call, Indian state's call, what they want to do. But do you want Oli government to enjoy 2.0? It, 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 it's, it's a big larger call and push Nepal further towards Chinese embrace. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's a moment of truth for Indian state to think over, seriously. Very rightly said. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, because we have only two minutes left. Now, I invite uh, Ms. Mitra Karti, program coordinator at NICE, to uh, deliver a vote of thanks. Sumitra Ji.
So with Razi. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, respected high dignitaries, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all the participants of the webinar on emerging trends in Nepal-India relations. As we come to the close of the program, it's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of NICE to all who have helped to make this event a grand success. Finally, of, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to sincerely thank all our distinguished speakers for their wonderful presentations. We were really honored to have such a distinguished panel with Professor S.G. Muni, Ambassador Ranstre, Dr. Constantino Xaviers, Mr. Achilles Upadhyay, and Ms. Apeksha Shah. Our sincere thanks also go to our moderator, Mr. Atul Kumar Thakur. The program would not have been possible without his support. We would also like to thank friends from diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different other organizations. We would like to thank the wonderful audience who participated to this webinar on thousands of others who are watching us on Facebook Live. Finally, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to members of NICE for putting this effort, especially Ritik Agrawal, our research intern, who is handling technical support for today. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our tradition to call our guest for a cup of tea. Unfortunately, we will not be able to solve it today. Please forgive us for this. We are truly honored to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Atul. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Atul. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And fellow Great panelists, you. of course. Great seeing you, everybody. Thank you. Great Thank pleasure. You. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. And thanks to the center for putting us together. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be sending the whole program's video tonight and hope to see you again for the next event. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank Sir. you, Dr. Jaswal. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Okay.